This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So for this week's topic, I want to take up the question of uh, alienation. Uh, Now, alienation is a concept that has a somewhat checkered history on the left, uh, but I think there's a very good reason why Today we might want to revive it and uh, consider it uh, in much greater detail because I think it has great relevance to helping us understand the relationships between politics and the economy. Uh, Part of the reason for the checkered history is that uh, Marx in his early years was very fond of uh, talking about uh, alienation and it played a very prominent role Uh, in his thinking when he wrote the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of uh, 1844. Uh, But at that time, the definition of alienation that Marx held to was really a sense that our daily reality was not in accord with our inner spirituality, if you want to call it that, Uh, and that uh, Marx had a rather idealist notion of uh, humanity. Uh, He came up with the concept of species being, and his argument was that capital was really preventing us from realizing uh, the perfection uh, of which we were capable, uh, given our species being. So it was an idealist concept, a utopian concept, uh, but it played a very important role in in, in defining the subjective sense of feelings of alienation, loss, and separation uh, that characterized much of the working class in relationship uh, to capital. So it was not entirely uh, redundant uh, as a scientific concept, but its basis lay in this rather humanist conception uh, of what human beings were capable of and the frustrations of that capacity Uh, by being embedded within a market system and being embedded in a system where a capitalist class uh, held the power. Now this uh, ideal of uh, alienation that existed in these early writings uh, were uh, problematic uh, even for Marx himself. So by the time he got to the end of the 1840s, he was beginning to write a different kind of interpretation in which he did not rely upon this idealist conception of species being, but relied more and more on historical interrogation of the concepts which would describe uh, the relationships which existed under capitalism and an attempt to create a more kind of scientific Marxism. And for that reason, we find there was a tendency uh, very strong in the 1960s and 1970s to try to erase alienation uh, from the scientific forms of Marxism that were favoured by people like Althusser, theoretically, and by the communist parties, which existed uh, in Europe at that time, uh, very much in close relationship with uh, the thinking of the communist uh, governments in the in, uh, Soviet Union. So in the 1960s, the the concept of alienation uh, tended to be abandoned on the grounds that it was not scientific, uh, it was not verifiable, uh, it was not therefore uh, to be considered part of what socialist and communist science should be about. Uh, But this argument that Marx abandoned the concept of alienation Uh, in the late 1840s does not fit very well with the fact that in 1857-58 he wrote a long manuscript called the Grundrisse. And in the Grundrisse uh, what we find is a situation in which the concept of alienation uh, comes back into the picture, but it has a very different uh, form and has a very different origin and a very different meaning. Uh, In the Grundrisse It looks like this, that uh, if we become separated from something which belongs to us and we therefore lose control over it, we become alienated from it. So Marx started to argue that the very act of exchange 
from one person to another meant that there was an alienation of the commodity as I traded it away, so that the form of alienation had a technical kind of meaning. But then that meant that as you built an understanding of how the market system worked, so that technical meaning took on more, far more broader meanings. So in the Grundrisse, Marx starts talking about how uh, the labourer is alienated from the labour process, alienated in the following sense, that they are employed by capital, they produce a commodity, but they do not actually have any power over the commodity they have produced, nor do they have any right to the value which is embodied in that commodity. So in a sense, uh, the labour which the uh, labourer can uh, provide is alienated from its product. But this is a, a, a technical alienation, which means that the value belongs to capital, the commodity belongs to capital. Furthermore, command over the labour process itself moves away from the labourer in the sense that the labourer who commands tools and skills and so on has, still has a certain power in defining how things are produced. But as time goes on and machinery is introduced and the factory system comes into being, what we find is that the labourer becomes an appendage of the machine and becomes alienated from the labour process itself. So the labour process, the labour product and the value therein, all of them are alienated from, uh, from the labourer. And that loss becomes, of course, part of a political claim which kind of says we should invent a kind of society in which laborers receive their just rewards and that they can claim rights over the value and the commodity that they have produced. But it's not only the laborer who is, experiences alienation. What Marx does is start to talk about the way in which capital experiences the same, uh, the same kind of problem. Now on this side, I think we have to actually stretch ourselves a bit to recognize that the capitalist begins, uh, in terms of uh, bourgeois theory at least, in a situation where holding property rights, they are free and there is a certain egalitarianism in the market process with which they engage. So that they, the starting point for uh, capital accumulation is one in which uh, the, the capitalist is, quote, free to choose, as Milton Friedman would put it. And that freedom of choice and the egalitarianism that comes from exchange and exchange becomes then, uh, if you like, the basis for the capitalist system. And the big issue that Marx then, then has to address is how does this system, which is based on the universality of equality and freedom gets turned into inequality and unfreedom, uh, even for the capitalist. And the answer there is that the market system is something that individuals do not control. The market system becomes, with uh, the proliferation of market exchange, becomes a system which actually forces capitalists into certain kinds of activities, whether they like it or not. And the phrase that Marx uses to talk about this a lot is the notion of the coercive laws of competition. That individual capitalists are not free to choose. Uh, individual capitalists will choose something and then find that it's not compatible with what the market demands, and that the market then will discipline them to do uh, this or to do that. And of course, this is something which is a, a, a certain commonality between Marx and Adam Smith, because Adam Smith uh, also took the view that the market was uh, something which uh, was uh, able to negotiate between all kinds of motivations and all kinds of activities to do it in a way uh, in which individual uh, motivations really didn't matter. What really mattered was the hidden hand of the market would decide what should be produced, how it should be produced, and how much it would cost, and all the rest of it. So this, what, what, what Marx talks about in the Grundrisse is the way in which the capitalist starts in a situation of, of freedom and, and the like, but it turns into a situation of unfreedom. And this, of course, then meets very much with the, the, the idea that you have alienated labor and alienated capital which come together uh, in the labor process. 
and that therefore that alienation is foundational uh, for what the capitalist system is all about and that alienation is therefore embedded uh, within uh, the, the, the capitalist system. And from this standpoint, alienation becomes a, 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 as much of a scientific concept as anything else. And while somebody like Althusser would claim that Marx went through an epistemological break uh, in 1848 when he switched from a language in which he could talk about alienation to one where he had abandoned the concept, the revival of the concept in 1858 would suggest that there is a way of bringing back the question of alienation into our understanding of political uh, economy. Now, this uh, form of alienation then suggests on both sides, both capital and labor, uh, that there are separations and that there are losses which uh, accrue. Uh, this comes out most clearly in Marx's chapter in Capital on the Working Day. In the chapter on the Working Day, what we see is uh, that the, the capitalist employs the laborer, uh, for a certain period of time in which uh, the laborer gets the value of labor power and then the capital extends the length of the working day to create a surplus and that surplus gives the surplus value to the capitalist which gives them uh, the profit that they seek. So surplus value is labor which, which really originates with, with, with the laborer uh, but which is appropriated by capital and this is a, a, a loss. Uh, but the coercive laws of competition basically put a situation in which if I uh, employ as a, as a capitalist, if I employ labor and I only employ it for, uh, you know, so six hours a day, but somebody else is competing with me and they employ their laborer for uh, eight hours a day, then uh, I am likely to find myself driven out of business. And very soon all capitalists are con you know, competing with each other uh, to extend the working day to, so that they get more and more and more profit. So this competition between individual capitalists uh, forces uh, individual capitalists, no matter whether they're good people or bad people, uh, to extend the market working day to a maximum unless there is some uh, mechanism uh, which is going to control uh, that tendency. And the mechanism is, of course, legislation uh, of some sort which will come into being to try to counter uh, this alienating activity of extending the working day so that it goes to you know more and more hours uh, so that you can actually uh, uh, control it by by saying we have a 10 hour working day or an eight hour working day or a 40 hour working week or something of that kind so the question of alienation then is is, is there because then we ask the question uh, to what degree is, does the labor, laborer get any kind of satisfaction out of uh, the labor process uh, and any satisfaction out of the fact that they are producing uh, the commodities that they produce? And here we come back, if you like, to the kind of subjective side of things. Uh, because when Marx starts to talk about capital uh, being ruled by abstractions, uh, those abstractions are the uh, ruling ideas of the ruling class. And to the degree that the ruling ideas of the ruling class hold sway, and then that does not create uh, the, an opportunity for uh, critique. And this is something which, however, uh, runs up against the workers' sense that they are being exploited, the workers sense that something is unfair about the fact that they are creating all the value and they're getting very little of it. And so this is one of the uh, points again where alienation comes back in. And so we could ask the question, to what degree uh, do working people feel alienated by their conditions of employment, alienated from the fact that they feel that the work they put in is not adequately re remunerated, uh, they feel alienated from the fact that they have no command whatsoever over the actual production process. That, pr that production process is uh, regulated from outside through uh, the use of machinery. They have no control over their time because the time regime is, is really dictated by uh, conditions of work within the, within the, the, the labor process. So that in all those respects, we would argue that the condition of alienation is latent within any workforce and is likely politically to be expressed. And at this point, the subjectivity of alienation, which is described back in the uh, economic and philosophic manuscripts, comes back into the picture. 
but is no longer an alienation from a kind of a, the perfection of which we are capable. It's really an alienation uh, from the realities of the daily uh, grind of going to work every day and working those hours and receiving only that form of remuneration. So the conditions of labor then are likely to give rise uh, to a sense of alienation. And a sense of alienation has a number of subjective consequences. Uh, one of the first consequences is that it's very difficult to imagine a labor force which is deeply engaged with what is going on uh, if it feels alienated. And the subjective condition of alienation tends to create uh, what you might call uh, a sort of a distance between uh, the, the, the labor process itself and the sense of satisfaction that can be derived from it. Now this doesn't mean that it's impossible for workers to feel any sense of satisfaction from the labor process even uh, within uh, under the domination of capital because uh, manifestly uh, that labor process can be organized by workers themselves on the line in such a way as to actually be interesting, uh, to be uh, a sense of value uh, attaching to it and a sense of pride in the work that they can they do. So you will find uh, labor forces employed under capital where there is some degree of contentment and there are strategies which emerge amongst the capitalists to try to encourage what's called ex-efficiency uh, by developing certain relations amongst the workforce and between the workforce and the supervisors and the capitalists which uh, actually uh, can do something about uh, the loss of alienation there was or the, or, or the loss uh, of, of satisfaction. Uh, so in the 1970s, for example, there were things called quality circles in automobile manufacture in which workers would get together and they would decide themselves what they would do on the, on, on the shop floor and how they would do it. They would often compete with other work gangs and so there would be a sort of friendly competition between them and one would try to outdo the other. So there are situations which arise in which you could look at a work labor process and say uh, this, is reasonable, this is reasonably unalienated in terms of its subjective conditions even though the underlying objective alienation still remain in place. But for most people, on the other hand, uh, there is a profound dissatisfaction. Uh, and when you start to look at some surveys of satisfaction in the labor process, you find a lot of negative uh, results. So there are uh, if you, surveys which suggest that about uh, you know fifty percent or seventy percent of the uh, labor force either are not interested in their work or don't care about it or hate it, and that therefore there's limited work satisfaction. And this then also contracts back to the nature of the labor process. The capitalist is not free to choose any kind of labor process. If a labor process is invented, which is mechanized and automated, and therefore where workers have almost no real serious creative and interesting role, and that is the most uh, profitable form of, uh, of, of a labor process, then uh, what, the, what will happen is the, the capitalist will be forced to, produce, to, to introduce that labor process. And I think it's no accident that those work circles and so on, which you would find in some of the auto companies in the 1970s and 1980s, disappeared in the 1980s as competition heated up between the different auto companies for how, how well they could work. Uh, and uh, therefore, again, capital does not freely choose uh, what its technology shall be and doesn't freely choose the conditions of labor that it will impose upon a workforce. Uh, when it comes through the factory factory gates. Uh, beyond that, of course, we also have uh, going on uh, the emergence of new divisions of labor and the disappearance of many industrial jobs and the transformation into kinds of rather meaningless service jobs and janitorial jobs and uh, all the rest of it, uh, which, which are jobs which have almost no uh, real content in terms of, uh, of, of physical satisfaction. 
so that uh, as the labor processes become reorchestrated around automation and uh, these days around artificial intelligence, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to find more and more job structures which have some satisfaction attached to them. In fact, uh, we could divide roughly uh, what goes on in society into two categories of uh, labor. One is the sort of mental uh, labor, uh, and the other is the routine uh, manual labor in, 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 in both uh, in, in industry and, and the routine labor in many of the service industries like banking and, and, and so on. So uh, what we need to look at today are what are the conditions of labor how much alienation is there? Is there a widespread and increasing sense of alienation with uh, employment structures and with uh, a loss of a regularity of work and increasing precarity of work and uh, temporariness of work? Is there some, something going on in that area which, which will say that there's less and less uh, satisfaction in, in the labor process today than there was many years ago, and in what sense will we argue that uh, the advent of a socialist economy will be a, 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 an attempt to, to uh, so minimize alienating labor that the alienating labor is reduced to something that is automated, artificial intelligence takes it all over, and therefore, therefore uh, we don't need people to do that anymore which would free up uh, time for everybody uh, to be able to do what they want. Uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of a socialist society, uh, in many, many cases, people will say one of the big signs of a socialist society is one where there's an abundance of free time for everybody, where people are emancipated from wants, needs, uh, and, and find themselves uh, able to live in that world that Marx described when he said that the realm of freedom begins when the realm of necessity is left behind. That if we can take care of all the necessities and do all of the alienating jobs uh, with, through automation and reduce the alienating jobs to just a few hours a week or something of that kind, then uh, the rest of the time we can do uh, very much uh, what we want and in a way uh, that we want it. So alienation in the labor process then uh, comes back into Marx's argument uh, in the Grundrisse in that kind of fashion. And while the word alienation does not actually crop up very much in Marx's capital, the fact of alienation is all over the place because Marx is talking about the way in which workers get turned into the appendage of a machine. Uh, that they move from a situation of being in control of the, the means of production uh, to being controlled by the means of production. Uh, Marx also talks about the alienation that attaches to the, the extent, the way in which the working day is set up. He talks about alienation in terms of the decision making uh, of, uh, uh, of the labor process. And what he does, in effect, is to actually resurrect. Uh, the categories that he, he, he described in the economic and philosophic manuscripts, which is the laborer is not in control of uh, the value they produce and has no right to the value they produce. They're not in control of the commodity they produce, which belongs to capital. They're not in control of the labor process and therefore the, the alienation uh, which exists there is important and beyond that there is an alienation in relationship to nature and the metabolic relation to nature because uh, we're increasingly forced uh, to exp extract value, extract uh, uh, raw materials from nature at an increasing rate. So all of these forms of alienation which are described in the economic and philosophic manuscripts come back but they're now embedded in a scientific understanding of the accumulation of capital and how the, the laborer is alienated, but also the capitalist is also alienated and forced into alienating ways of activity because the capitalist is not in control. Uh, they are being driven by abstractions, and those abstractions uh, are the abstractions that come from the ruling ideas of the ruling class. So that is one part of the alienation story which I think we should recognize is important in today's world and is therefore the source of much of the discontent uh, which exists in this world. So let me leave it there and then we'll come back to this question uh, in the next blog.
Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.